This is a story about a woman who slips through time. It's the day before Casey's 40th birthday. Her acting career and personal life are a disaster. Frantic to escape her own emptiness, she hops a plane to England and heads to the countryside to hide. That's when a lightning strike, a skidding car, and a horse that might be magical send her through a gap in time to the Dark Ages. Do not move. I froze. Arms to your sides, slowly. In slow motion, I brought my bloody fingers away from my face and lowered my hands to my sides. The group had grown to about a dozen men. The gorgeous one stepped out from the rear. In an accent stiffer than that of the others, he said, The king ordered me to deliver you to him. He sounded French, but his speech was more guttural than the French accents I knew from Los Angeles waiters. That's narrator and author Patria Burchard. And we're talking about her historical fantasy, Camelot and Vine, on this Desideratum. A desideratum is an essential thing. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, and I think storytelling is a desideratum. Both the telling and the listening. A big thank you to this episode's sponsor, Positron. I use Positron in my audiobook prep and proofing process to save time and ensure accuracy. Their AI-powered software suite cuts hours from the audiobook, voiceover, and any scripted audio production process. You can sign up for a free demo of all that they offer at Positron.com. Just to give the listener an idea of what happens, she gets on this plane, gets drunk on the plane. She's hung over by the time she gets to England, and... When she finally falls through a gap in time and runs into King Arthur, she saves his life completely by accident. And he thinks that's magnificent and that she must be a wizard. And so she's like, yeah, I'm a wizard. (laughs) Sure. But it gets her into trouble after a while. You give us glimpses then of her childhood and her parents and her father and her father's love for uh, the King Arthur stories. It kind of traces back to, for us where that where that comfort with lie, or maybe where the hesitation with exposing truth. That might be a better way to put it. I like that. So you take us into her childhood. We see her past, but then you also deep dive into deep, deep past. It's really fun to be there with her. And I wondered as a... Um, as an oral storyteller, right? So your mind created this character, put her through this experience. While you were doing that, were you were you hearing it? Were you thinking of it as a narrator as well? No. No? Not at all. And I wish I had. Because narrating it wasn't all that easy. <laughs> I thought that myself. I thought, wow, she's put herself in a tough spot here. So talk a little bit about some of the challenges of this as an oral storyteller, as a narrator. Lancelot is French, and at least half the characters are British men. And uh, King Arthur is described as having a gravelly voice. And uh, so I wrote myself some challenges. And yet, Teresa, I... I want people to like the book, but none of them will ever love it as much as I do. There's something about it that's so personal to me. And so I couldn't possibly have hired somebody else to narrate the audiobook. I had to do it myself. And I coached, I got dialect coaching from both PJ Oakland and Amanda Quaid. And I worked on all of it and did my best. I love how you just explained it as a labor of love, I thought you brought them to life really lovely. It's not surprising to me that they're they're of you. Um, the other thing is there's, there's sword fights and there's horseback rides. How did you do all of that? 
I did a lot of research. Some of it, I mean, obviously it was just in my head, but I did do a lot of research. I used to ride horses as a young person. So I, I knew a little bit about how that feels and how it's done and, and how you bond with a horse as she does with hers, her rental horse. <laughs> In less than an hour after we left the woods, the riding rhythm slowed, then stopped. No one had spoken since we'd gotten clear of the forest. I stayed low in the cart to listen. The horses won't make Cadavia today, said Bedweer. Yes, said Lancelot. I invite you and your men to refresh at Post Perdu. It is better to make the trip tomorrow after rest. Lucy sighed. Tied by a rope, and trudging along behind the wagon, she must have been as tired as I was. I tried to sit up. Over my right shoulder, an infinity of tall grass waved in peaceful unity. The sun rose over endless plains, burning off the last of the mist and telling me we headed south. I turned as far as I could to the left and caught my breath. A few feet off the road stood Stonehenge. When I'd ridden by it in a taxi cab the previous day, the stones had reminded me of tamed beasts in a decrepit zoo. But in the morning sun, the monument stood proud. The grass grew high and wild enough to sway in the breeze. Stonehenge was wanton with weeds. We were so close to the stones, they dwarfed us. How had we gotten so close? They don't let you just walk right up to the monument. You pay at the visitor center, you wait in line with the other tourists, you circle around on the sidewalk. We were the only ones there. No tourists, no traffic, no visitor center, no fence. Things were not just bad. They were wrong. I had maps of where my locations were. How long would it take to ride from this place to that place at night? Knowing that I was writing a fantasy, it's not a history. It's not even historical fiction. It's hard to categorize, but I guess you'd call it historical fantasy. It is a real place, and I wanted it to be as real as I could make it. In fact, for the place where Catabir is, which is the setting that we would call Camelot. Cadabir is actually a hill in South Cadbury, England. It's an old and ancient hill fort where there was some kind of battle right around 500 AD. So that's where I set most of the story because it could have happened there. And there was an archeological dig there. So there was the hall and the huts and everything those were there. And I just, I wanted to make it as real as I could. So I researched the clothing and the food and the landscape and what would things have been like. And so writing it, it took a few years because, you know, in the meantime, I got married, I moved, I moved again, my mother died. Um, a lot happens, life happens. And I wanted it to be I wanted it to be as good as I could make it. Yes. Yeah. I think that's what's really compelling about fantasy that helps you suspend your disbelief, right? That you, uh, and authenticity creates that. And I think this is one of the themes too that comes from the honesty theme, the telling the truth theme. She's, she's a person who doesn't have a lot of friends. She doesn't care to have friends. She hasn't tried to make friends. She just doesn't care about other people that much. But as she gets more deeply involved with Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot and all these people there, there are mo plenty more people, uh, Guinevere's friends and uh, who become her friends, who become Casey's friends. They really embrace her. They're not in a competitive industry, they're working in a place where they have to work together in order for things for each other to be safe 
and to be prosperous and to have enough to eat. They have to work together. And everyone does. Everyone pitches in and does their part. And she's expected to do that too. And she starts to really admire them. And they, they just take her in. They're just happy to meet her. They welcome her. And uh, she's never known people like this. She comes to care for them and love them. And then, you know, when there's something awful about to happen to one of them, she knows she's the one who can do something to help. And when she does, it could kill her. But I think part of writing that made me think about how, you know, when I first started acting, I really, uh, I wanted to be a big movie star. I wanted to be Meryl Streep. I wanted to be internationally famous. I wanted to be a jet setter. I thought I wanted this. I thought I wanted these things. And they didn't happen. And I came to realize how fortunate I was that they didn't. <laughs> because I, I was not, you know, I think one of the reasons we admire Meryl Streep is she seems to be emotionally capable of handling. She's a good example of handling all that fame and fortune with grace and still having a life. Now, I'm not sure I would have been able to do that with grace. So I've been fortunate to be able to do things that I love to do a little bit under the radar. But I had initially thought that one of the reasons to be a star would be so that once I die, I'm not forgotten. It is something that drives people to be remembered, to be known. Yeah. And how to make that kind of impact. And I think she discovers in this story the kind of impact she really wants to have, the way she really wants to be remembered. Yeah. It's a brief life. It's a brief period of time here. And what what do you leave behind? It's like a, It's like punching into a bucket of water and pulling your hand back out. The water just seals back up. Time just keeps marching on. Oh my gosh, what an image. I thought your writing was so beautiful towards the end. There's a sentence towards the end. Mostly I wept for time. Time gone, time done that can't be undone. Time we can't reach down through to touch those we've loved and lost. Like, I think, you know, it's, it's fun to think of a fantasy of time travel, but really what she comes to know about her time and her life and how you express that and how we're connected to others is really very moving and touching. Thank you. Well, that sentence about time, because I know you're going to ask me what is essential. Because <laughs> I've listened to your podcast and I love that. To me, that's what is essential is time. In so many different ways, time is such a, an amazing thing. I mean, in some ways, it doesn't even exist. It's not a thing, but you feel it moving on every day. I think it's why I fell so in love with England. All those old ruined castles and all those old cathedrals and all those places where there's a, a stone fence with a style over it. Um, people have been going there, walking there, living there, and that really got me how much I wanted to reach down through time and talk to those people and see them. There's just something about time that is really hard to describe, but I was kind of trying to get to it in the book. There is something about time that starts to feel different, that our experience of time as we age, it, the passing of it feels different somehow. It feels more fleeting. And it is, it, is, it is true, I think, that it starts to feel like it's going faster. And that's not possible. I mean, it's time. It does what it does. Like you said, the hand in the bucket. There's not, you're not changing it. You just have less of it as you go. And it's everything. It's not a thing, and yet it's everything. It's time. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with Patria Burchard as much as I did. I hope you'll listen to the rest of her audiobook, 
Camelot and Vine. If you follow the affiliate link in the show notes to Libro.fm, when you purchase the audiobook, you are also supporting this podcast. Thanks again to Positron for their continued support. If you liked this episode, please interact with it. Like, subscribe, follow, review. It's essential to the podcast's reach in helping others find us. So thanks. And, as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>